Question. Introduce yourself. Tell us about your dog life journey. Answer. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tom Angus. I am the youngest son of my late father, John Matthew Angus, and the grandson of Matthew Angus. Together they created JMA Matthews Working Patterdale Terriers, and JMA Kennels. Question. Why did you choose this breed? I think it's fair to say that I never had a choice. I grew up in a working dog environment. There were literally black fell terriers running around everywhere I looked. Question. How did you develop your passion for dogs? Answer. Dogs were in my blood. I grew up to become a fourth generation terrier man. Although if I had be to be totally honest about it, I always wanted something different for myself. At the age of 19 I moved away from the North East of England to attend university on the South Coast. My ambition was to become a graphic designer graphic artist. After the first year I realized that it wasn't for me. I went on to study general nursing at the University of Southampton. Twelve years into my nursing career I was involved in an accident so I was therefore forced to change direction. I went back to school and ended up with a master's in clinical psychology. Over the 16 years that I was away from the northeast of England and my father's dogs, I didn't really give them much thought. I knew they were being worked, but that was about it. My father had a great role model whilst he was growing up and learned a lot from this man. Mr. Cyril Bray was my dad's godfather and possibly my grandfather's closest friend. He was certainly my grandfather's oldest friend. They first met when they were teenagers and shared a lot in common, mostly working dogs. I was born three years after Mr. Cyril Bray passed away in his early 70s. My grandfather followed on the following year. Question. Who was your mentor s in the dog life? Answer. I started to get involved again in 2006, due to my father's health which started to fail. He passed away in September of that year and I felt it my duty to carry on his work to the best of my ability. Between myself and two of my older brothers, we had a kennel of over 20 dogs to see to. Besides this my late father had friends dotted around the north of England that kept his line for working purposes. You probably realize by now that I don't really like to call them Patterdale Terriers. I'll go into that a little later. Being part of the working terrier world, I'm learning more and more every day that I spend with these little black terriers. I moved back to the Northeast in 2010. Since then I've been working, as a clinical psychologist, in the private sector. It's very well paid so I don't have to work lots to get by. Since my accident at work and my change of career, my health has slowly deteriorated, but I'm lucky to have help from both near and far. Through my oldest brother's family and good friends such as Robert Booth who has over 50 years of breeding experience. He knows my family's line of terriers well enough to be able to help me continue my efforts. I'd say that I have many role models, but Robert Booth and my late father have to be the people that has inspired me the most. Question. Any last words for this episode? Answer. I don't agree with the origin of the Patterdale Terrier. Joe Bowman never intended to call them Patterdale Terriers. It wasn't until after his death that the locals of Patterdale decided to name it after their village. In truth, they were in existence a long time before his birth. The original Black Dog Terrier was the Old English Terrier, which in some parts of the UK were known as Black Fells. Joe Bowman also bred Red Fells. Poachers bred them smaller and added blood from pit dogs. Dogs used for hunting and fighting in the pit rings. They were commonly sold at the livestock sales at Granger Market, Newcastle upon Tyne. They were more commonly known as Northumberland Pit Terriers. As Newcastle was then part of Northumberland before the county's borders changed. This is the bull blood which was used within the breeding of my great granddad's digs. He wasn't anyone important, just a local poacher. As you can imagine poachers needed black dogs to hunt at night. If you look up Old English Terrier, you'll see what I mean. By the time of the, the Second World War, my grandfather had added other blood from Cyril Bray dogs and left his longtime friend, Cyril, to run his dogs. It was Cyril Bray that turned these little binding terriers into an elite working terrier. He used the best blood from others within his community, digs that were well proven. 
It was at this time that Joe Ware added in blood that was infused with bull terrier blood, the ones listed above. It, in my opinion, is Cyril Bray that created the best Patterdale strain in history. In the 60s and 70s the true Patterdale Terrier, if I must adopt this name, were smaller, more compact and very easy to span. They were worked on anything from mice to badgers, were mostly broken coated and would fight to the death with any quarry. And were also, in 95% of cases, black in color. Since then, other breeders have added other blood, whether that be Jack Russell, Border, Lakeland or Bull Terrier blood. In doing this the color variation has widened. In a lot of cases, they are now too big to work rabbit and fox, but they have also become bullier, shorter legged and often not able to work the abundance of quarry that they were meant for. Some have become so hard, they don't last a season due to the damage they suffer. My family have tried to keep them as Cyril Bray bred them. Smaller and far more intelligent, but still willing to give their life if need be. The biggest issue that I have here in the UK is that I believe that a dog should be fit for purpose. Once you start to see genetic deformities, you have to think about if there are any that aren't visible on the outside. I believe that to breed a healthy strong line that can improve other lines, then you have to look at conformity as well as working ability and intellect. Bloodlines are important, but quality means that a dog has to be fit and healthy. Within Patterdale Terriers, stupidly never makes for a good owner or terrier. A dream dog can only give you 100% if he or she is physically and mentally healthy. Still though, this is only 50% of producing a great dog. The other 50% comes in the form of a responsible owner. Robert Booth still produces some of the best dogs here in Europe. It's for this reason alone, that if I outcross then it's to his strain. One of the best known lines of Patterdale Terrier is the Nuttall line, however they aren't what they used to be. They are now bred with shorter legs to suit badger hunting. A true Patterdale Terrier should have no white markings on their legs, paws, body. What used to be acceptable is a white patch on their chest, but not too much as to spread onto the underside of the dog. These days that rule has gone out of the window. They are now bred with white toes, chins etc. Question. What is the purpose and function of the breed? Answer. Their true purpose is hunt quarry. As I've already said in part one of this interview. However they are now being used to compete in agility sports and, due to their keen nose, they are being used by border patrol to sniff out drugs etc. in confined spaces such as import and export containers. They are still used for pest control throughout Europe and the USA. They are also receiving admiration throughout the rest of the world, and being used, for these purposes. Question. Do you show your dogs any special training? Answer. True black fell terriers, aka Patterdale terriers have a natural instinct to hunt, but they are being used more and more in the show ring. The JMA strain have excelled in hunting and in the show ring. Other people have used them successfully for showing, but this is not their true purpose. I have been fortunate enough to show them in working dog trials for which I too, as a team, man and dog, have had a steady compete to win ratio. Both myself and Robert Booth have judged at such events, although, whilst I've stayed within Europe, Robert has judged much further afield. For working purposes, and their 50%, they don't need much training, as it's naturally bred within them to hunt, but the other 50%, being that of their owners, we should really allow them time to mature and bring them on slowly. This allows them time to grow stronger whilst visually learning how older dogs work their quarry. It's best to start them off on small rodents whilst teasing them with the pelts of larger quarry. A good terrier man should always know their environment, the lay of the land, seasonal changes, other risk factors such as hard rock areas and wooded areas that will have abundant tree roots underground. They should also go well prepared carry a first aid kit that is substantial enough to treat both man and dog. Have both digging and cutting equipment. 
As anti-hunting laws within the UK can prohibit the use of terriers, we have to obtain permission from landowners or local authorities, giving us a legal right to use our dogs for pest control. The Hunting Act 2004 is an act of the Parliament of the United Kingdom which bans the hunting of wild mammals, notably foxes, deer, hares and mink, with dogs in England and Wales. The Act does not cover the use of dogs in the process of flushing out an unidentified wild mammal, nor does it affect drag hunting, where hounds are trained to follow an artificial scent. You can use up to two dogs to chase, flush or stalk, foxes out of hiding if the fox is causing damage to your property or the environment. Your dogs can't go underground to find foxes unless they're threatening wild or game birds kept for shooting, only one dog can go underground at any time. You must shoot the fox quickly after it's been found. Carry proof you own the land you're shooting on or written permission from the landowner. Question. Can Patterdales handle cold hot weather? Answer. Working fell terriers in general can handle both hot and cold weather better than most other dog breeds, although saying this we always keep our kennels well insulated and heated within the colder months. Question. What living situations are best for the breed? Could they live in an apartment or house with a small yard? Can they live with other animals including small dogs and or cats? Answer. Patterdale Terriers have been known to live successfully both inside and out. They can live in small apartments, however they need a lot of exercise to keep their minds stimulated. Without this they can become unruly and hard to manage, but they are generally much quieter than most other terrier breeds. They are good with children and people in general, but like all other dog breeds, they should not be left alone with small children. It's therefore advised that there is an adult present to supervise any interactions at all times. They are not good with other small animals such as cats or rodents. With good management, Patterdale Terriers can live successfully with other dogs, but due to their gameness, they need to be introduced slowly. Patterdale Terriers usually play well with other dogs whilst outside of their own territory, their home. Question. If you were to crossbreed one of your dogs what other breed would you use? Answer. For hunting purposes I would not cross them with any other breed of dog. However if I wanted to improve another breed, it would have to be the English Bull Terrier. Since the 1960s they have been slowly modified to resemble what other people like the look of, in doing this they have become unfit for their original purpose and now suffer from other abnormalities. I feel that Patterdale Terrier blood could reverse this, if done right. Tom Angus, Patterdale Terrier Part 3 What I have learned throughout my life, and what some people don't understand, is that our dogs have to be fit for purpose, have strong well-balanced conformation with good action. The biggest reason why a lot of good earth dogs don't do as well, long term, isn't down to them not being hard and steady, it's due to abnormalities such as poor conformity, diseases such as arthritis and genetic disorders, both visible or hidden. I like my dogs to tick all the boxes. If they don't then I won't breed from them. Yet intelligence of both dog and owner is always a huge factor, if not the biggest. This is important in both working with any working terrier, and in responsible breeding. The true Patterdale is an extremely courageous working terrier, traditionally used to go to ground. Patterdales are extremely willing to work and have a high desire to please. They are very active and have a strong prey drive, and though they should be peaceful with humans, livestock and other dogs, they are not a dog for the novice or average pet owner. They require an owner with a sense of humor and one that understands and can tolerate the real terrier temperament. Breed standard. The head is strong and powerful, in balance with the size of the dog, and wedge or trapezoidal shaped when viewed from the front. The skull and muzzle should be equal, or with the muzzle slightly shorter than the skull. Both jowl and muzzle requires substance. The muzzle should be strong, never appearing snippy or weak. A full complement of strong, white teeth meet in a scissors or level bite. Teeth that are broken, or incisors that are lost, due to working, are a usual occurrence. The eyes are set squarely in the skull and fairly wide apart. As an earth-working terrier, it is important that the eyes do not protrude or bulge. Eye color should be in harmony with the coat color, but never blue. The ears are triangular in shape, and small to moderate in size, folding tightly just above the skull. 
The tips point to the outside corner of the eye. Black except in the liver chocolate colored dogs, which have a brown nose, more commonly referred to as red or pink. The neck is clean, muscular and of moderate length, widening gradually from the nape and blending smoothly into the shoulders. The shoulder is long, sloping and well laid back. The forelegs are strong and straight, with good bone. The elbows are set close to the body but move freely. Pasterns should be powerful and flexible. Faults, bowed legs, fiddle front, down in pasterns, toes turned out, knuckling over or any other misalignment of joints, out at the elbow. In proportion, the body should be square or slightly longer than tall, measured from the point of the shoulder to the point of the buttocks, and from the withers to the ground. The back is of moderate length and level, blending into a muscular, slightly arched loin that has slight to moderate tuck up. The chest should be firm yet flexible, deep to the level of the elbow but moderate in width and oval in shape. Spanning. Spanning is an important part of the working and judging process for the Patterdale Terrier. They must be spanned to test for size, compression and flexibility. The Patterdale should be capable of being spanned directly behind the shoulders by an average sized man's hands. When spanning, lift the front legs off the ground or table and gently squeeze the bottom of the chest to be certain that the chest will compress. Faults, chest too deep or wide, incapable of being spanned or lacking the ability to compress. Body too cobby or barrel shaped, causing lack of flexibility of the back and will not allow it to turn or make its way around whilst working underground. The hindquarters should be strong and muscular. Bone, angulation and musculature match that of the forequarters. The stifles need to be well bent and the hocks should be well let down. When the dog is standing, the short, strong rear pasterns are perpendicular to the ground, and when viewed from the rear they are parallel to one another. The tail is set high but not carried over the back. If docked, only one quarter to one third should be removed, as sometimes the tail is the only means of pulling the dog out of a hole. The tail should be strong but not overly thick. There is no preference between docked or natural, however, I myself prefer them to be docked for working purposes. The coat may be smooth, broken or rough. In all coat types, there should be a short, dense undercoat, also known as a slape coat. Very little grooming is required to keep the coat healthy. Smooth. Hair is coarse, dense and stiff, falling back in place when lifted. No wave is present. Broken. An intermediate coat, having longer guard hairs than the smooth coat. The guard hairs are coarse and wiry and may be wavy, yet not curly. A broken coated dog may or may not have face furnishings which form a beard, moustache and eyebrows. Rough. The hair is coarse and longer overall, including the face and ears. It should be, again wavy, but not curly. A correct coat is important for protection against the wet underground and briars. Dogs with damaged coat sections, that are due to hunting, scars or abrasions would not be penalized in a show ring as long as overall texture can be determined. Serious fault, coat in any climate that is soft, long or downy in texture. Color. Acceptable colors include black, red, liver chocolate, grizzle, black and tan, and bronze, either solid or with some white markings on chest and feet are now acceptable, however white toad and paws are due to incorrect breeding. I personally believe that this is a fault. Black dogs may have some lighter hairs in their coat. Red may range from tan to deep rust, some black around the muzzle is not uncommon. Liver chocolates may be a very dark chestnut to a lighter brown. Black and tans may have more or less of these colors. Black and tans are again due to modern breeding practices, any reputable breeder will try their best to eliminate this color variation. Albinism. Any patch or spot of white marking on the body or head. Not to be confused with scarring which can cause white hairs to grow in would lead to disqualification in a show ring. Height and weight. The Patterdale Terrier ranges in height from 10 to 15 inches at the withers. Weight should be in proportion to height, with dogs always shown in hard, fit, working condition with no excess fat. Originally, the height would range from 9 inches to 14 inches, from the ground to the wither. I prefer them to between 10 and 14 inches tall. Gait. When trotting, the gait is effortless, smooth, powerful, and well-coordinated, showing good but not exaggerated reach and drive. 
the top line remains level, with only a slight flexing to indicate suppleness. Viewed from any position, legs turn neither in nor out, nor shield feet cross or interfere with each other. As speed increases, feet tend to move towards centerline of balance. Movement faults should be penalized to the extent that they would interfere with the terrier's ability to work efficiently. I have worked with and judged most hunting terriers. This includes working Border Terriers, Jack Russell Terriers, working Lakeland Terriers, Bedlington Terriers, Staffordshire Bull Terriers and English Bull Terriers. They all have their place, and jobs that they will excel in. I have also owned and worked with coursing dogs such as Whippet, Greyhounds and Lurchers. My favorite breeds, besides Patterdales has to be the American Pit Bull Terrier and the Caucasian Shepherd, but due to UK government legislation, I have yet to do so. I have helped working and exercising by dogs from family and friends who all have a lot of experience with the breed. I used information from the United Kennel Club's breed standard. This seems to be the most accurate, however it's probably too lenient for my own breeding purposes. I prefer to keep them as original as my father and grandfather bred them, in coalition with those bred by Cyril Bray.